Here are three common exercise mistakes. 1. Assuming that exercising more means that you will live longer than other people. You won't. Professional athletes, who exercise much more than the rest of the population, do they live longer? A new study from 2020 tracked the death rate of 6,000 Olympic athletes from Germany for 60 years. What did they find? I'm quoting. Currently, the survival rate of German Olympians is lower compared to the general population. On the contrary, it was found that Olympic success represents a linear risk for survival probability. So not only these Olympic athletes seem to die sooner than the rest of the population, the more successful they are, you know, those who exercise harder and longer, die even sooner. What's going on here? If you're one of the 1 million viewers who have watched my autophagy activation video, then you are not surprised. You know that not every exercise leads to longevity benefits. The second common mistake is thinking that building muscle mass means that you have a healthier body. Building muscle mass continuously can kill you faster. Ask bodybuilders, we have 30% higher mortality rate than the rest of the population. And it's beyond just steroid use. Bodybuilders keep their bodies continuously in a muscle growth mode instead of fitness preservation mode. This turns off many longevity genes. So what's the truth? The truth is that the preservation of a youthful fitness levels and muscle mass and not muscle building is what makes you healthier and live longer. In other words, staying the same muscle mass and strength as when you were younger, this is the secret for youthfulness and longevity. A common mistake number three is assuming that simply being in a good shape physically means that you are healthier and that you will live longer. The truth is, exercise will make you live longer only if you use exercise to target longevity mechanisms in your body. Your entire exercise routine should revolve around achieving the following three goals if you want to stay healthier for much longer. These three exercise goals are activating autophagy, preserving your youthful fitness levels, and reducing blood sugar. Both average blood sugar, which is called A1C, and daily peak blood sugar, you want to reduce both of them. And over the last 16 years, I've been searching and researching the best ways to use exercise to target those very three goals. I found 12 simple ways that you can do that today. This video is for you if you want to beat the odds and live longer than the rest of the population. Give yourself a chance to be one in 5,000 people who pass the age of 100 without spending more money or time on exercise. It's a long video for a longer life. Welcome to the Wellness Messiah podcast. I'm your host, Rimon. Exercise intensity matters. Before longevity, it matters to your brain's health too. Let's hear Dr. Rhonda Patrick speaks about that. Of course, any exercise is better than none. But for me, I'm very focused on neurodegenerative disease. What I've sort of come to the conclusion of is that intensity does make a difference with respect to the neurobiological effects. Exercise intensity. And the intensity of your exercise is not just a matter of brain health. It's also going to help you live longer. A study of nearly half a million people suggests that intense exercise leads to the greatest longevity benefits and reduced mortality. Let's hear now Dr. James O'Keefe, our cardiologist, speaks about this study. Okay, and this is a study of over 400,000 Chinese. They found that vigorous exercise, this is all-cause mortality reduction. The more reduction, the better. And this is minutes of daily exercise. So. 10, 20, 30 minutes of daily exercise up. At 40, it starts plateauing. At 45 or 50, you get a point for further, uh, further uh, it plateaus. So further efforts and time do not convey, appear to convey further improvements in life expectancy. Down here is moderate exercise, light to moderate exercise, walking, housework, day to day, moving around. Just get off your seat, move around. More is better there. It doesn't, it's not quite as beneficial as vig vigorous exercise, but more is better. You can exercise all day. The study that Dr. James O'Keefe mentioned is from 2011. It is called Minimum Amount of Physical Activity for Reduced Mortality and Extended Life Expectancy, a prospective cohort study. As you can understand from the study, intensity is positively correlated with reduced mortality. 
Reduced mortality indicates youthfulness preservation. If the subject of longevity interests you and you want to design your lifestyle in a way that will naturally make you live longer, I invite you to check my new longevity course. Go to wellnessmessiah.com forward slash course. It's a wellnessmessiah.com forward slash course. What is intensity? In terms of exercise, intensity is the actual stress that you expose your muscles, your heart, and lungs to. And this is truly what creates hypoxia and muscle damage. Exercise intensity is controlled by three parameters, speed, resistance, and time under stress. For example, if you run, you're training your leg muscles, your heart, and lungs. If you increase your speed, you increase your intensity on those organs. However, if you run at the same pace for more time than usual, to the point that your body struggles, basically you increase your intensity by increasing time under stress without changing your speed. And thirdly, if you run and now you carry a heavy bag in your pack, this increases the resistance against the power of gravity. So this increasing your intensity without actually increasing speed or time under stress. To summarize, there are three ways to control our intensity. We can use those three ways with our exercise routine. The first is speed of movement. The second is weight, which is the power of gravity. And third, time under stress. How long consecutively our muscles are exposed to this exact resistance, meaning the movement speed or the weight we put and apply in our bodies. So you can apply these three principles to any exercise that you're doing right now to increase the intensity. In addition, there is a place where intensity can backfire. If there is too much intensity, this is not good as well for your longevity. So if intensity is so important to create hypoxia, but also excess intensity can be problematic as well, it means that intensity, the dose of exercise, is critical for activating autophagy. Of course, as I speak about intensity, with anything I'm going to say in this video, it's not personal advice or recommendation. Please consult your doctor about your individual situation, now about increasing the intensity of our exercise routine. You can easily measure this impact of intensity based on how your body responds. Difficulty to breathe normally suggests hypoxia. Does a marathon runner find it hard to breathe after one kilometer? I don't think so. So no hypoxia there. Another indication is high pulse or heart rate. This suggests hypoxia as well. The heart struggles to supply oxygen and remove CO2. And the third indication is difficulty of the muscles to sustain the stress. This suggests hypoxia, but also muscle damage. Of course, intensity is purely subjective. For an Olympic marathon runner, running one kilometer is not intense, and they will hardly activate any hypoxia or autophagy this way. However, for a person who just recovered from a long bedridden illness, one kilometer of walking is way too much and may lead to apoptosis and muscle wasting. So intensity is simply pushing your individual bar a bit higher. There is a different sweet spot for everyone, and every situation is different. You should know that you can't go from no exercise to high intensity training. This way you're going to get injured. Intense training is possible only after you get into a solid shape and you know how to train without getting injured. If you don't actively exercise, find an expert to guide you through getting into shape before you start with high intensity exercise. And besides, intense exercise can be dangerous if you have a medical condition. So please consult your doctor before engaging in any intense exercise. One of the holy grails of youthfulness preservation is creating the minimum damage that activates longevity pathways. And with exercise, we do that by using the right frequency in our exercise routine. The definition of frequency here is how often do we train intensely on a specific muscle or area. It means the resting time between exercising intensely on a specific muscle. For example, training our back muscles once a week and sprinting twice a week simply gives us a frequency of once a week to the back and twice a week for the legs and the heart. We don't need to add these exercising up because they target different muscles. 
walking and low intensity activities won't necessarily be counted here into our frequency. What does it mean practically? It means that we want to exercise intensely to achieve hypoxia and muscle damage, but we want a frequency that is just enough to stimulate repair, meaning activating autophagy, and also just enough to maintain our muscle mass over the years, but not more than absolutely necessary. Therefore, in my opinion, which is also based on my 12 years of personal experimentation with this, is that exercise for longevity should be intense and not frequent. That is to say, if it is not intense enough, then no damage will occur and there will be no sufficient hypoxia. If it's too frequent, it will cause too much damage and it's not good for the preservation of youth either. In other words, what we're trying to achieve here is activating autophagy, but get away with minimal amount of damage. And this way we're gonna reap all longevity benefits. So we want to find the sweet spot for our bodies. And you wouldn't believe how long between exercises you can go without losing muscle mass. But training infrequently doesn't mean inconsistently. You do want to have a consistent training schedule. In fact, it will increase and will not decrease your autophagy response. It is true because we know that if you train your muscle frequently, then we know that autophagy will kick in faster. In contrast, if you were to just starting out with your exercise routine, therefore it will contribute to your longevity. It also suggests that if you exercise, you don't want to stop your routine. You want to maintain this autophagy momentum in your muscles without yo-yoing it, just like with avoiding yo-yo dieting. But I'm sure from what I've seen with my subscribers that that's not your problem. From looking at your comments, I know that you're very consistent with your lifestyle. So keep up the good work. We want you and need you to stay young and healthy. Question, what do you do if you enjoy working out every day or going to the gym every day? If I were to exercise very frequently or going to the gym every day, what I would do is doing the intense exercises infrequently and make sure that all the other exercises I'm doing frequently, I am doing them in medium to low intensity. This combination will reap all the longevity benefits and you will use your exercise enthusiasm to make you live longer. What I also like about the strategy is that you're not chained to your exercise routine, meaning that you have the freedom to skip everyday exercises with a low to medium intensity. For example, if you go on vacations. When I measured my blood sugar, two of the biggest surprises that I had had to do with stress and bad sleep. I noticed that when I was stressed or when I sleep poorly that day, my blood sugar spiked 20 to 25% without eating any sugar. It's a sugar that my body used to make by converting protein into sugar. Now, why is that important, you may ask? Because these increases in blood sugar are really bad for your longevity. You want to keep your blood sugar as low as possible within the limits of healthy, normal range without becoming hypoglycemic. The studies are documenting this phenomenon very well. Keep your blood sugar low and live longer. Both average blood sugar, which is called A1C, and daily peak blood sugar. You want to reduce both of them. I don't think there is any debate at this point. So after measuring my blood sugar, I knew that poor sleep wasn't good for my longevity. And my only way to counteract this phenomena is first, try to sleep better, which is not really possible, especially when life happens. And two, what I tried to do in, in the days that I did sleep poorly, was try to take a nap. But all in all, I was too merciful on my own body because I said, you, you know what, I didn't sleep well, I won't push my body too hard that day. I was actually afraid of creating too much stress, too much cortisol. I was afraid that poor sleep will increase cortisol and then intense exercise will increase cortisol as well. But recently, I watched an interview with Dr. Rhonda Patrick and it was obvious to me that I'm missing something. Let's hear this segment now and see if you get the same light bulb that I had when I listened to the interview and then get back to the habit. The biggest and most compelling and most important data point that I sort of learned from wearing my continuous glucose monitor which was the effect that my sleep interruption 
yeah. had on both my fasting blood glucose. I could get like pre, like what can be considered like pre-diabetic. Like I was like blown away. I was like, what is, this is insane. And the effect lasted at about, I would say like about 48 hours or so. When I did work out and I was at the time I was doing a lot of high intensity interval training. I was, it was like an hour long sp- spin class I used to go to, you know, where they do all this interval training. Um, that it almost completely blunted that effect where I, even though I was dog tired, last thing I want to do was go to my damn spin class. I was just like, this is like, I can't, it's going to be bad for me if I go. That's how I felt (laughs) like it's going to be bad for me. But it was completely the opposite where crazy glucose, you know, dysregulation and it was almost completely blunted and it was so profound. And really that was the thing that for me was like, I have to work out no matter what. She said that she measured CGM, which is Continuous Glucose Monitor, and she found that exercise was the only antidote that actually managed to reverse completely the impact of bad sleep on blood sugar. So this is fascinating. I didn't know that exercise can do that, to be honest. So my resistance of applying physical stress on my body in days that there was stress, quote unquote, because of bad sleep, was a mistake. And I did not have practical step or practical habit to reduce this blood sugar. Rhonda said, in the days that we sleep poorly, this is the best time to not give up on exercise and actually do the intense exercise that day. And today I have another tool. I call this habit exercise in days of poor sleep to reduce your blood sugar. And by the way, on a personal note, everyone has their biggest weakness when it comes to routines for health. Some people have difficulties with taking supplements. Some others have problem with diet others with exercise. I have clients who don't like to exercise and have to devise programs with zero exercise for them. My biggest weakness has to do with my sleep. So for me, sleep, which sounds like the easiest thing of all of those tools, actually is the most difficult thing for me. Especially it was difficult in the last seven months since my wife had a stroke. So for me, I'm stopping with the mercy on my body. When I sleep poorly, I'm going to exercise harder. Let's see if I could follow through with the action because talk is cheap. What about low intensity activities? What about them? Do they promote our longevity? Is there any value for low intensity activities? Let's look at the study from 2019 who can give us insight into the value of the habit. This study from 2019 is called Potential Effects on Mortality of Replacing Sedentary Time with short sedentary bouts or physical activity, a national cohort study. Sedentary time defined as any time a person is sitting down or lying down. For example, lying down includes sleep. Sitting down includes activities, quote unquote, such as watching TV, working with a laptop, commuting, dining, and playing video games. I'm quoting from the study. So they took 8,000 people, a total of 7,999 participants, provided compliant accelerometer wear. And all the participants were 45 years old or older. And they followed them over a median follow-up of 5.5 years. Now, what did they find in this study? We found that replacing 30 minutes of total sedentary time with 30 minutes of low-intensity activities, LIPA, was significantly associated with 17% lower mortality risk. This is the first point. What can we learn from that? Well, for longevity, moving is better than not doing anything. Being active in everyday life matters too. Walking 10,000 steps, doing low intensity sports, dancing, scuba diving, moderate jogging, leisurely sports. Light activity is something else entirely and it has other benefits for our health, but it won't necessarily target autophagy. So this is a different aspect of our exercise routine and it has nothing to do with high intensity exercise for autophagy. I want to make this clear. There is a place to be active moderately in most days and infrequently engage in high intensity training. In fact, what I have found is that intense exercise keeps the muscles in top shape. So the rest of the time, you want to be more active. Your muscles are itching to move and do something. This is youth and it comes from healthy trained muscles. So when you train your muscles, you want to lift things. When you are trained in boxing, you're probably looking for the next brawl. So by no means, don't do high intensity training and then lie in bed all day. We want to use our fitness levels to move. 
both intense exercise and low intensity activity are valuable for our longevity in health. Increase the intensity of everyday activities. Here, we are still dealing with the everyday activities, not the infrequent, intense exercise I mentioned before. Now, before I'm going to explain the habit, let's look at the study from 2019. Another interesting thing they found in the study, they found that replacement of the low activity levels with 30 minutes of MVPA, MVPA means moderate to vigorous physical activity, was significantly associated with 35% lower mortality risk. So what does it mean? It means that if you're already moving and you're not sedentary and you move more intensely, now you double the longevity benefits from 17% to 35%. This is terrific. And it makes sense because if exercise is a drug, then the intensity is the dose. And this dose up to a point as we spoke has increasing longevity benefits. It activates autophagy, it burns off blood sugar and reduces the peaks of sugar from our meals. Intensity also improves insulin sensitivity. It reduces insulin resistance. It decreases blood flow to our brain and the entire body. And the intensity even helps to detoxify our bodies by pumping the lymph system. You know, this sewage system that we have, and for this system to move, it's completely dependent on the movement of our muscles. There is no other pumps for this sewage system. So if we're already moving, if we're already walking, going with a dog to a walk, why not increasing a bit our intensity? It can be excellent both for our longevity and also for our time management because we're going to save a bit of time every day. So a few examples. If you walk from point A to point B, try to make it faster. Walking up the stairs, well, try to climb faster, based on your medical situation, of course. If you go on a swim, try to swim a bit faster. When you do house chores, try to hasten them so you can increase the intensity without, of course, breaking the dishes. And my conclusion with doing the dishes fast is that even though I increase my longevity, I reduce the longevity of my dishes. Now, another interesting thing they found in the study, I'm quoting from the same study, this is the third finding. There were beneficial associations of replacing total sedentary time with short physical activity bouts on a mortality risk. Now, how long and how often these short bursts of intense exercise lasted? They said between one to five minutes every 30 minutes. And these short bursts were enough to reduce mortality and reap longevity benefits. So what does it mean? It means that short bursts of activity of just a minute or two provided a health benefit. So if you walk from your house to the store, doing it a bit faster, even for one or two minutes, has some benefits. Try to make your low-intensity activities into moderate-intensity activities, especially it's helpful after meals. And it's very difficult to be too intense in those situations. What will happen to your muscle mass, fitness levels, and your body fat if you sit most days but exercise intensely infrequently? From my experiments, when I do that on many weeks and I've been sedentary, I've been sitting for many hours every day, yet I implemented this high-intensity infrequent training, I did notice the following results. According to my measurements, I did not lose muscle mass. However, I did lose some fitness levels, about 10%, especially the endurance part of my exercise. Interestingly enough, I did stay 8% body fat. I stayed lean and fit, but I kept a healthy diet too, which is a big deal here, of course. And of course, I knew all along that I did not receive all the longevity benefits. And it's better for me to do this high-intensity infrequent training plus being active most of the days. My suggestion is this. If you plan to not move most of the time, then at least focus on nutrition during those times, such as avoiding sugar and excessive carbs, which will do more damage if you have a sedentary lifestyle. The bottom line is this. Both intense exercise and low intensity activity are valuable for our longevity and health. And they are both can be used for our next strategy. One of the common mistakes in our longevity community is assuming that autophagy is a global phenomenon. It is not. Now, the study I mentioned from 2015 speaks about that. I'm quoting, in conclusion, autophagy seems to be necessary for adaptation by providing locally the condition for muscle plasticity and apoptosis systematically by mobilizing progenitor cells. So autophagy happens locally within the specific muscles. What does it mean? 
When you train a certain muscle, you increase autophagy within this muscle. And if you train intensely enough, you also activate autophagy in the heart and in the cardiovascular system, both of which are exposed to the same stress coming from the muscle. But this is where it stops. If autophagy is somehow activated in other organs, it happens to a much lower degree because the organ itself isn't exposed to this intense damage in apoxia that the muscles that you're targeting and exercising on is exposed to. Exercise won't induce autophagy throughout the entire body. Not all the organs and all the muscles in your body are going to stay young if you only focus on single muscles. It means that training your legs won't create autophagy in your back muscles. It means that if the only thing that you do is running, you will keep those leg muscles and the heart young, but not the rest of the muscles or the organs. And you know, it makes sense. You already know that if you train your biceps, your back muscles are not going to grow. So why would it be any different with autophagy activation? If you want to stay young and live longer, you want to keep all your muscles young, not just one of them. Now, which is better for achieving autophagy? Resistance exercise, such as lifting weights, or aerobic exercise like running and jogging? Both high-intensity aerobic and resistance training activate autophagy because they both can create hypoxia and muscle damage. And a very little known fact is that every resistance exercise, every weightlifting actually is a cardiovascular exercise because every time that you challenge your muscles with weights, it's also gonna increase your heart rate. However, every resistance exercise is not a lung exercise. It's a heart exercise, but not lung, what is called pulmonary, as opposed to aerobic exercise that is both cardiovascular and lung. So it's pulmonary cardiovascular activity. The bottom line is that also resistance exercise activates autophagy in the heart when it's done intensely. Another benefit of aerobics over resistance training is that it exposes the heart to a different type of stress, prolonged stress. Let's say that you run for 10 minutes with the intensity going up gradually. You'll see your pulse, your heart rate going up as well in this gradual way and staying up for 10 minutes. This is a unique type of stress on the heart, which I think is complementary. In addition, this high pulse doubles or even triples the amount of blood that your brain receives for those 10 minutes nourishing the brain faster and allows the brain more time for dumping toxins into the blood. Therefore, intense aerobics provide a unique value to the lung, the heart, and the brain. Very important organs. The conclusion is that ideally we want to integrate both resistance training and aerobics exercise in the right intensity. And together, they will cover every aspect of longevity benefits from exercise by activating autophagy and preserving our fitness levels in a complementary way. So both of these are very important for preserving our youthfulness. We spoke about how intensity activates autophagy and how we need to use high intensity training, possibly interval training, but infrequently. So far, so good. The problem is with over exercising. Over exercising, meaning exercising too hard, too intensely without a proper rest and recovery nutrients will overtax the repair system. When we overexercise, we hurt the ability of our repair system to do its job. Instead of activating autophagy, it could lead to the death of muscle cells. And this could lead to muscle wasting. How do I know that the exercise I've been doing, the high intensity exercise I've been doing was intense enough, but not too intense? is having muscle soreness, what is called domes, after the exercise when your muscles, they, they ache a bit. If you have it one day after the exercise, but not after one day, it suggests small amount of damage, which is good. So that could be a good indication you use a very good intensity. You don't have to feel this muscle soreness, but I, my rule of thumb is one day is, is okay. Having more than one day, at this point, I'm transitioning into a large muscle damage, which could promote muscle growth if I'm going to eat high protein diet. But this is not pro-longevity. This is not your preservation. It's more like for growth. So my rule of thumb is maximum amount of one day of muscle soreness. 
And this rule of thumb came from many years of tracking my body weight. And I noticed that when I achieve more than one day, then I have to eat high protein diet to recover from this exercise. Otherwise, I'm going to lose muscle mass. I'm going to uh, achieve apoptosis. This is not good. So I'm not telling you this based on my ideology, simply based on my experimentation and measurements with my body. And when I wanted to build muscle mass, usually have muscle soreness for five, sometimes six days. So if you have trained very hard on your legs, you know that the legs could have a painful impact for four, three, five days. So this suggests not necessarily the right intensity, but too much intensity, which has a proclivity to increase muscle mass if you're going to eat excess protein. But in the everyday use that you want to preserve your muscle mass, it's unnecessary. And you do that by avoiding overtraining, but also by providing rest and nutrients. Because exercise is just a stimulus, there is a synergetic effect between exercise for longevity, sleep, and nutrition, which doubles or even triples the benefit. You see, exercise provides the stimulus, then sleep and nutrition, they provide the response to the stimulus. This better and faster response results in activating autophagy faster and deeper, plus better fitness levels, less injuries, and reducing the average sugar levels, all of which contribute to your longevity. For example, we know professional athletes who sleep better have fewer injuries. Fewer injuries indicate an active repair system, and it also indicates less accumulated damage. In addition, you can also use a proper nutrition. This will allow the repair system to use the nutrients to repair the damage and use that to increase the longevity of your entire body. The point here is this. You can squeeze more longevity benefits from your exercise by incorporating deep sleep and healthy nutritional habits. So if your friend and you are doing the exact same exercise, you are going to extract way more longevity benefits and more health benefits for the same amount of effort, the same workout. What is blood sugar? You have five liters of blood in your body. In that blood, you have many nutrients. One of them is sugar or glucose. The body is using it to maintain a minimal function of various systems. The body has to maintain this minimal baseline levels. Now, this blood sugar is also called blood glucose. This is, by the way, the result that you see in your blood tests. So on the one side, we need this baseline level of blood sugar. On the other hand, we can increase blood sugar beyond this baseline. And this increase isn't good for your health or your longevity. So now you understand the two levels of blood sugar. And the term that you need to remember is sugar spike or glucose spike. Glucose spike refers to the increase of sugar beyond the baseline, the secondary level of sugar. Now you may ask, when do our sugar levels spike? And what can we do about it to live longer? The first major way is when we eat sugar and carbs. Carbs are trees of glucose that exact sugar. And when you eat food with carbs and sugar, you're gonna have an increase in this blood sugar beyond the baseline level. So this level of sugar entering into the blood from the food that we are eating is gonna add on top of the baseline sugar levels that we spoke before. The second way in which blood sugar goes up above this baseline levels is when the body, specifically the liver, manufacture it out of protein. Yes, the body can create sugar out of protein. It's a very simple process. It's called gluconeogenesis. Now, when does the body convert protein into sugar? The first time is when you eat protein. Every time you eat protein, some of it is going to end up with sugar. That's how the liver works. The second time the body manufactures glucose sugar is when you're stressed. When I take blood tests, whenever I'm stressed, I always see my blood sugars up about 20 to 30% as if I ate sugar or protein, yet I ate nothing. This is one of the reasons why chronic stress is so bad for you. It's almost like eating sugar. And this increase of sugar, this sugar spike above the baseline level is associated with increased aging and shorter life. Let's get practical here. How can we use exercise to reduce those blood sugar spikes and increase our longevity? There are two habits that we can extract out of this principle of lowering the highest blood sugar of the day. Let's hear now from Dr. Ron Rosedale, a founder of the Colorado Center for Metabolic Medicine and a world's expert on sugar and aging. In this interview, Dr. Rosedale spoke about his recommendation 
on the exact timing of using exercise for controlling blood sugar spikes. I'm quoting from him. The best morning after pill for mistakes in diet is exercise. If you're going to eat something that is going to raise your blood sugar, one of the major benefits of exercise is that it allows you to burn off that sugar and doesn't leave it around as long to do damage. The best time to exercise, if you splurge on something that you know you should not have, is immediately afterwards. Your blood sugar will rise immediately after you eat. Let's say that you ate potato, and that's going to cause your blood sugar to go up. You're better off to burn off that sugar that the potato is going to turn into than to leave that sugar around to glycate and raise your insulin and cause insulin resistance. Dr. Ron Rosedale referred to potato as a potential to become sugar because potato is simply a tree of many glucose molecules. And this is true to all high-carb foods, pasta, bread, cereal, anything really that comes from grains. Dr. Ron Rosedale did not mention sweets, but you already know that eating sweets and desserts will increase your blood sugar. It has sugar inside. Therefore, I call this habit exercise after sweets and carbs. Practically, it means when you eat sugar, sweets, or high-carb meals, then try to move after, be physically active, and ideally not too long after the meal, after the dessert. A good timing is somewhere around 5 to 30 minutes after the meal. What I also like about this habit is that it stops binging. I used to be addicted to sugar and sweets and carbs, and when I started eating sugar, I simply could not stop eating it. But I noticed that as I implemented this habit, as I exercised for a few minutes, immediately the binging impulse stopped. So if you're like me, and you binge on sweets and find it difficult to stop, exercising after sweets, after eating sweets, stops the binging roller coaster. And honestly, the shame that comes with it. Notes about this habit. 1. The activity doesn't have to be high-intensity exercise. Any physical activity, any physical movement is good, but it needs to be soon after eating sweets and carbs. 2. The more intense the movement, the faster you'll burn blood sugar and bring it down. So if you add a lot of sugar and a lot of carbs, intense exercise is going to reduce the spike faster. 3. The amount of sugar that you ate matters too. If you ate a lot of sugar and carbs, then you want to exercise and move for a longer time because you need more activity to burn more sugar. And four, you can plan your pleasure meal and desserts immediately before exercising. Today, finally, I avoid sweets. But back in the day, I used to plan my pleasure foods right before exercise. Exercise I had to do anyway. And I also put sweets immediately before walks out of the house that I needed to do anyway. Practically, you can save the pleasure foods for times that you know you're going to exercise immediately after. So this is the beginner's habit out of this principle. If you're like me, eventually you will manage to control your sweets eating and carbs. You manage to overcome the cravings, then you're ready for the next level. Every meal will raise a bit your blood sugar. And for longevity, we want to reduce any unnecessarily increase in blood sugar. Here comes the more advanced habit. Eat to exercise. This strategy you can copy from Cristiano Ronaldo, really. And I believe this strategy is one of the reasons and is partially responsible for his career longevity. Let's hear his teammate explains how Cristiano Ronaldo lifestyle looks with eating and exercise. But you once went for lunch with him at Manchester United. I think you were going to have a gentle lunch and it turned out to be a very competitive afternoon. He said, let's go and having a lunch after training. Go to his house. I look at it. It was just some salad, plain white chicken. No juice, just water. So we have a food, quickly a lunch. And after that, he said, let's go in the garden and play two-touch. I said, Christian, we just finished. So we go playing two-touch. After that, let's go for a swim. <laughs> after that, let's have a sauna, jacuzzi. I was like, Cristiano, why you di we didn't stay at the training room? <laughs> yeah. So that's why I said, Cristiano deserve everything. Yeah. That's funny. This guy is known to eat meals to give him energy to exercise almost immediately after. So in essence, he actually eats to exercise. Now let's expand on the name of the strategy. Most people, including myself, use meals as a motivation to exercise. It's much more motivating to do intense exercise knowing that a nice meal is waiting for us after. And for most of my life, I did exactly that. Push myself to the limit with my workout, followed by rest and digest. 
I exercised to eat. However, those large meals create the highest blood sugar of the day. I measure that myself, and even when I eat protein, no carbs or sugar in the meal, some of that protein will become blood sugar. Our liver converts some protein into sugar, and we want to reduce that. Now, why is that important? Because we know that reducing those sugar spikes after meals increases longevity. Learn from Cristiano Ronaldo. Keep certain workouts, not necessarily all of them, after large meals. That includes also house chores. So we can use both high-intensity and low-intensity exercises after meals. So to summarize, eat to exercise instead of exercise to eat. This will squeeze more longevity benefits from your routine. What's the difference between this advanced habit to the previous habit? Well, in the previous habit, we assume that you will eat sweets and carbs from time to time. With this one, you can implement it after any meal with protein. Second, this strategy suggests a more intense exercise and truly intentional timing as part of our exercise routine. In other words, we plan some of our workouts to be exactly after meals, by design. This habit, believe it or not, I managed to implement only in the last two years. So today, what I do, I plan certain workouts that are part of my exercise plan, exercise routine, immediately after the largest meals of the week. I've heard criticisms about bringing up this habit. Criticisms such as it's dangerous to exercise after meals. Because, you know, the gut and the muscles will compete for blood and nutrients. Well, I've been doing this habit for the last two years and I feel fine. And so is Cristiano Ronaldo. Some clarification, though, about this habit. This should be obvious. If besides protein you also ate carbs in the meal, this meal would be the best time, the best timing, to add exercise immediately after. It would be better to do that over a non-carb meal. Another note that I don't feel the need to exercise after eating vegetables or oils, such as salad with olive oil. Instead, I keep my exercises and workouts for the largest meals of the day, those that have a lot of protein. Because remember, the body is going to convert some of this protein into sugar, and it's going to increase our blood sugar. It's going to cause a blood sugar spike. The third note is that you don't need to do many exercises to achieve the purpose. Even one workout for 5 to 10 minutes will help a lot to flatten the sugar curve. Reduce self-judgment. I found that just being aware of the value of this habit helps a lot. What you'll discover that over time, simply knowing intellectually the value of this habit, you'll naturally be inclined to apply it. Remember, it took me 12 years to transition from beginners, meaning to burn sugar after sweets, into eat to exercise habit. Now, you don't have to do this with every meal, but it's really important after high carb meal or a large meal. And the last note is that you don't need to plan all of your workouts this way. Personally, I don't do it with every exercise. If the exercise is too intense and it requires a lot of concentration and focus, I much rather do it on empty stomach where I can concentrate. I like to use workouts as a meditation to reduce stress. And it works better for me if I do them on empty stomach. So it depends on the type of workout. As you can see, the habit is pretty flexible. The habit requires some experimentation and seeing how you feel. Maybe you are too tired to move after a meal. So don't be too tough on yourself and try to integrate it to your lifestyle based on your comfort level. Now, let's recap everything that we have learned today and make it easy to remember. We want to exercise for longevity. We want to exercise for youthfulness preservation. And for that, our goal is to use exercise to activate three tactical goals. To activate autophagy, to preserve our fitness levels, and to reduce the highest blood sugar of the day. These are going to achieve the maximum longevity and youthfulness preservation benefits according to the latest science. Now, let's organize the habits we learned today into two categories. Habits relating to intense exercise that we do infrequently and habits that we do every day, in everyday activities. These habits we covered today are related to our intense exercise routine. 1. Increase your exercise intensity, but not too much. 2. Reduce your frequency. 3. Exercise all key muscles at least once every two weeks and include both aerobics and resistant training. Stay consistent with your exercise routine despite being infrequent. 5. Keep certain workouts after large meals or sweets. 6. Avoid overtraining. 
meaning too much intensity or too frequently. I gave you the rule of thumb I found on my body is that your muscles aren't sore for more than one day. If they hurt more, they are open for muscle growth, not youthfulness preservation. 7. Improve your sleep and nutrition to double or triple the benefits of your high-intensity exercise routine. These habits relate to the everyday activities. 1. Use your fitness levels to be active most days. 2. When you can, increase the intensity of these everyday activities. Even short bouts increase health, which leads to the next habit. Consider short bursts of 1-5 to five minutes of exercise after long sitting sessions. 4. Try to do something physical after eating large meals or eating sweets, even if it's a low or medium intensity activity. And lastly, exercise in days of poor sleep to reduce your blood sugar. Any physical activity will help you reduce blood sugar due to poor sleep, but Dr. Rhonda Patrick says that she found high intensity interval training nearly abolished the entire effect. Now, do a screenshot, print, and hang on the wall or in the office. Share. Now the last section of today, let's see the big picture because exercise is not everything in longevity, so we need to see how exercise fits to our entire longevity strategy. And here is the plan that I've got for you. Ideally, you want to know all the possible effective steps, try them and choose what fits to your lifestyle. And then ideally, you will see if the action that you're taking are moving you in the right direction. Imagine if you could take action and see how it affects your biological age. So for that, you want to measure aging and your biological age as accurately as possible. And the third step of this plan is you want to stay on top of the newest research and longevity technologies out there and use these technologies and research as fast as possible when they become available. These three aspects are exactly what we are about to cover in my newest longevity course called Project 120. You can access this course within seconds when you go to wellnessmessiah.com forward slash course. Now, is this course the right for you for what you're looking for? Let me present to you the three aspects of this course and you can make up your own mind. See if this is something that you want to try. So in the first section, you will discover the best action from my research you can take right now to lower your biological age. We will break down more than 50 key longevity strategies and habits by their potential impact on your biological age, possible risks and side effects, difficulty of implementation, amount of research backing them, and the best age and health level to implement them. We'll include habits, which foods to eat to stay young, and of course, which supplements to take. Oh yeah, supplements. You may have seen one of my research videos on YouTube and you know how in-depth I go with every supplement because every supplement has its own world. We have to understand the mechanisms, how it affects other mechanisms in our body, how different supplements cooperate with one another, and we are going to discover that in the course. We're going to discover which supplements to cycle, which ones to take every day, and you probably know that I don't work with any supplement company, I'm not an affiliate of any supplement company. And another benefit of this course is, you know, I've been researching these supplements since 2007. And what it means to you is that I know both the old school supplements for longevity and the newest one. And you're going to discover all of them in this course. I included all these supplements. I don't care if something is old school or new school. If it's going to keep your body young, you need to take it. You need to take it now. And by the way, if you already have my complete supplement routine, this course is even better because my supplement routine is my routine. It's customized to my body, my goals, my age, and you may have different goals and you may be in a different age and you may be benefiting from different supplements that I do not take. So we're going to cover even supplements that are not part of my routine, but my research shows benefit to other people as well. And to make the supplement list even more suitable for your needs, we divided the supplements into three categories, conservative, intermediate, and aggressive groups. This way you can choose the supplements and habits that fit your age and your personality, and how aggressive you want to be is really up to you. Would you like to give it a try and see how it fits in your lifestyle? Go to wellnessmessiah.com forward slash course. It's wellnessmessiah.com forward slash course.